Hi there, and welcome back to NTRA Bedtime Stories. My guest tonight is Pedro. He's going to be joining us for the second chapter of The Black Stallion. We should recap what happened last night. We met Alec, and he was homeward bound from India after spending some time with his uncle, who's a missionary. He's on a big, big ship that's sailing with lots of supplies, and a very magical thing happened in Arabia. A black stallion boarded the ship. Oh, Alex is so excited about this, and he's working on his friendship. So let's continue. Chapter two, the storm. The Drake stopped at Alexandria, Benghazi, Tripoli, Tunis, and Algiers, passed the rock of Gibraltar, and turned north up the coast of Portugal. Now they were off Cape Finester on the coast of Spain. In a few days, Captain Watson told Alec they would be in England. Alec wondered why the black was being shipped to England, perhaps for stud, perhaps to race. The slanting shoulders, the deep, broad chest, the powerful legs, the knees not too high nor too low, these his uncle had taught him were marks of speed and endurance. That night, Alec made his customary trip to the stall, his pockets filled with lumps of sugar. The night was hot and still. Heavy clouds blacked out the stars. In the distance, long streaks of lightning raced through the sky. The black had his head out the window. Again, he was looking out to sea, his nostrils quivering more than ever. He turned, whistled as he saw the boy, then again face the water. Alec felt elated. It was the first time that the stallion had drawn back into the stall at the sight of him. He moved closer. He put the sugar in the palm of his hand and hesitantly held it out to the stallion. The black turned and once again whistled softer this time. Alec stood his ground. Neither he nor nor anyone else had been this close to the stallion since he came on board. But he did not care to take the chance of extending his arm any nearer than to those bare teeth and curled nostrils. Instead, he placed the sugar on the sill. The black looked at it, then back at the boy. Slowly he moved over and began to eat the sugar. Alec watched him for a moment, satisfied. Then as the rain began to fall, he went back to his cat. He was awakened with amazing suddenness in the middle of the night. The drake lurched crazily as he was thrown onto the floor. Outside there were loud rolls of thunder and streaks of lightning that made his cabin as light as day. His first storm at sea, he pushed the light switch. It was dead. Then a flash of lightning again illuminated the cabin. The top of his bureau had been swept clear and the floor was covered with broken glass. Hurriedly, he pulled on his pants and shirt and started for the door. Then he stopped. Back he went to the bed, fell on his knees and reached under. He withdrew a life jacket and strapped it around him. He hoped that he wouldn't need it. He opened the door and made his way staggering to the deck. The fury of the storm drove him back into the passageway. He hung onto the stair rail and peered into the black void. He heard the shouts of Captain Watson and the crew faintly above the roar of the wind. Huge waves swept from one end of the drake to the other. Hysterical passengers crowded onto the corridor. Alec was genuinely scared now. Never had he seen a storm like this. For what seemed hours, the drake plowed through the wave after wave, trembling, careening on its side, yet somehow managing to stay afloat. The long streaks of lightning never diminished, zigzagging through the sky, their sharp cracks resounded on the water. From the passageway, Alex saw one of the crew make his way along the deck in his direction, desperately fighting to hold on to the rail. The drake rolled sideways, and a huge wave swept over the boat. When it had passed, the sailor was gone. The boy closed his eyes and prayed. 
The storm began to subside a little, and Alec felt new hope. Then suddenly a bolt of fire seemed to fall from the heavens above them. A sharp crack, and the boat shook. Alec was thrown flat on his face, stunned. Oh, slowly he regained consciousness. He was lying on his stomach. His face felt hot and sticky. He raised his hand and withdrew it, covered with blood. Then he became conscious of feet stepping on him, the passengers yelling and screaming. They were climbing, they were crawling all over him. The drake was still, his engines were dead. Struggling, Alec pushed himself to his feet. Slowly he made his way along the deck. His startled eyes took in the scene about him. The drake, struck by lightning, seemed almost cut in half. They were sinking. Strange, with what seemed the end so near, he should feel so calm. They were manning the lifeboats, and Captain Watson was there shouting directions. One boat was being lowered into the water. A large wave caught it broadside and turned it over. Its occupants disappeared in the sea. The second lifeboat was being filled, and Alec waited his turn, but when it came, the boat had reached its quota. Wait for the next one, Alec, Captain Watson said sternly. He put his arm on the boy's shoulder, softening the harshness of his words. As they watched the second lifeboat being lowered, the dark-skinned man appeared and rushed up to the captain, waving his arms and babbling hysterically. It's under the bed, under the bed, Captain Watson shouted at him. Then Alec saw the man had no life jacket, terror in his eyes. He turned away from the captain toward Alec. Frantically, he rushed at the boy and tried to tear the life jacket from his back. Alec struggled, but he was no match for the half-crazed man. Then Captain Watson had his hand on the man and threw him against the rail. Alec saw the man's eyes turn to the lifeboat that was being lowered. Before the captain could stop him, he was climbing over the rail. He was going to jump into the boat. Suddenly, the drake lurched. The man lost his balance and, screaming, fell into the water. He never rose to the surface. The dark-skinned man had drowned. Immediately, Alec thought of the blood. What was happening to him? Was he still in his stall? Alec fought his way out of line and toward the stern of the boat. If the sit stallion was alive, he was going to set him free and give him his chance to fight for life. The stall was still standing. Alec heard a shrill whistle rise above the storm. He rushed to the door, lifted the heavy bar, and swung it open. For a second, the mighty hoof stopped pounding, and there was silence. Alec backed slowly away. Then he saw the black, his head held high, his nostrils blown out with excitement. Suddenly he snorted and plunged straight from the rail and Alec. Alec was paralyzed and he couldn't move. One hand was on the rail, which was broken at this point, leaving nothing between him and the open water. The black swerved as he came near him, and the boy realized that the stallion was making for the hole. The horse's shoulder grazed him as he swerved, and Alec went flying into space. He felt the water close over his head. When he came up, his first thought was of the ship. Then he heard an explosion, and he saw the drake settling deep into the water. Frantically, he looked around for a lifeboat, but, but there was none in sight. Then he saw the black swimming not more than 10 yards away. Something swished by him, a rope, and it was attached to the black's halter. The same rope that they had used to bring the stallion aboard the boat, and which they had never been able to get close enough to the horse to untie. Without stopping to think, Alec grabbed hold of it. Then he was pulled through the water into the oncoming seas. The waves were still large, but with the aid of his life jacket, Alec was able to stay on top. He was too tired now to give much thought to what he had done. He only knew that he had had his choice of remaining in the water alone or being pulled by the black. If he was to die, he would rather die with the mighty stallion than alone. He took one last look behind and saw the drake sink into the depths. For hours, Alec battled the waves. 
He had tied the rope securely around his waist. He could hardly hold his head up. Suddenly he felt the rope slacken. The black had stopped swimming. Alec anxiously waited, peering into the darkness. He could just make out the head of the stallion. The blacks whistle again. The horse had changed his direction. Another hour passed, then the storm diminished to high rolling swells. The first streaks of dawn appeared on the horizon. The black had stopped four times during the night, and each time he had altered his course. Alec wondered whether the stallion's wild instinct was leading him to land. The sun rose and shone down brightly on the boy's head. The salt larder he had swallowed during the night made him stick to his stomach. But when Alec felt that he could hold out no longer, he looked at the struggling, fighting animal in front of him and knew courage came to him. Suddenly he realized that they were going with the waves instead of against them. He shook his head, trying to clear his mind. Yes, they were riding in. They must be approaching land. Eagerly, he strained his salt-filled eyes and looked into the distance, and then he saw it. About a quarter of a mile away was a, a small island, not much more than a sandy reef in the sea. But he might find food and water there and have a chance to survive. Faster and faster, they approached the white sand. They were in the breakers. The black scream shattered the stillness. He was able to walk. He staggered a little and shook his black head. Then his action shifted marvelously and he went faster through the shallow water. Alex's head whirled as he was pulled toward the beach with his ever increasing speed. Suddenly he realized the danger of his position. He must untie this rope from around his waist or else he would be dragged to death over the sand. Desperately his fingers flew to the knot. It was tight. He had made sure of that. Frantically he worried on it as the shore drew closer and closer. The black was now on the beach. Thunder began to roll from beneath his hoofs as he broke out of the water. Hours in the water had swelled the knot. Alec couldn't untie it. Then he remembered his pocket knife. Could it still be there? Alec's hand darted to his rear pants pocket. His fingers reached inside and came out with the knife. He was now on the beach being dragged by the stallion. The sand flew in his face. Quickly, he opened the knife and began to cut the rope. His body burned from the sand. His clothes were being torn off of him. His speed was increasing every second. Madly, he sawed away at the rope. With one final thrust, he was through. His outflung hands caressed the sand. As he closed his eyes, his parched lips murmured, Yes, Uncle Ralph, it did come in handy. And that is the end of our second chapter. I hope you all enjoyed it. It sounds like a lot is going on for Alec in the Big Black. Maybe tonight or tomorrow you could get a map out and try to figure out exactly where Alec is. Somewhere between England and where was the last stop? Do you remember? We'll find out tomorrow. And hey, Pedro, thanks for joining us tonight. Okay, everybody, be good, take care, see you tomorrow night.